Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Keith Dodds, and on behalf of ThoughtWorks, I want to thank you for taking your time to, to come out this morning. I know that you know when it popped into your inbox six weeks ago, it was easy to hit accept, and when you actually have to get up early and it's cold, it is an effort to get out uh, to these things. So uh, thanks indeed for, for sharing your time with us. Um, this is our second uh, quarterly briefing for 2010. We've been running this series pretty regularly, pretty quarterly, for about five years now. And we try to pick out topics that we think are going to be of interest to um, thought leaders uh, in our industry. Uh, we hope to provoke your thinking uh, and maybe even start the occasional argument, so don't hold back. Our topic this morning is on agility and the customer experience. Now, uh, both of those things as disciplines have been around for a while now. Uh, a, a lot of companies are practicing agility in their um, software or even uh, broader uh, development activities. Uh, user experience has been around for a long time. I think Clement Mock wrote the first book on user-centered design in the early 90s. Uh, certainly had a big, uh, big kick with the, with the internet, L led to a, a lot of different people looking at uh, ways of improving customer experience. But the reality is that until fairly recently, they were regarded as separate things. Um, and what we're going to be talking about this morning is how to put those two together. Uh, and that if you do that, you can actually achieve some fairly uh, interesting and progressive results. Um, if you've read, read Seth Godin's work, in particular Purple Cow, uh, the ability to uh, create standout services and products, i.e. produce a purple cow in a, sea of, in, a, in a sea of brown and black cows, and you have something really remarkable that the customers really notice. And that, and that really is where we're trying to get to with, with this presentation today. One of the things that we've noticed in the past is that people can come to a presentation like this and given the, the particular topic, walk away and think, oh, that's what ThoughtWorks does. They're a, an, agile, an agile user experience company, you know, and, 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 and you know, those that have worked with us know otherwise. But uh, just if, if you don't know us, I just want to take a couple of minutes, and this will be the only commercial break today, uh, just to tell you what we do. Uh, because about 60% of our revenue is generated by delivering software projects uh, either for our clients or working together on site with our clients, frequently the latter. Uh, about 35 to 40% of our revenue is, and, and, and that's been on the increase in the, the last 18 months or so in Australia, it used to be about 25%, is actually based on consulting with our clients to show their staff how to do the kinds of things that we do. Because it turns out that there's something about that way of working that is appealing and attractive to them, and it's frequently one of the reasons they hired us in the first place. And if they thought that was good, they'd like their, their people to learn how to do it too. So um, that's what we do, and that's how we make our money. Uh, just before we get to the topic, a few housekeeping tips. Uh, one, please turn your phones on silent. You don't want to be the one with the embarrassing ringtone that goes off right in the middle of the presentation. Um, there's an evaluation form on a green sheet on each of your chairs. Please do take a moment at the end of the seminar just to fill those out. Uh, we, we actually do uh, appreciate and, and rely on your feedback for our continual improvement, so please do that for us. There's also a flyer for the Agile Alliance Conference coming up in, uh, later in the year in Melbourne. And if you were, if you were or weren't at the, the inaugural conference uh, last year in Sydney, I think everybody who was there thought it was really a, a terrific uh, event. It was really high energy, high level. Uh, I go to a lot of conferences, and it was one of the best conferences I've been to in a long time. And I think the 2010 conference in, Mel in Melbourne is going to be even better. There's a little um, sticker on, the, on the, the flyer for that, which gives you a discount code. If you go and register the website uh, at the Agile Alliance and use that discount code, you'll get $100 off um, as, a, as get a guest of, of ThoughtWorks. So, Use that if, if you would like to register and get that discount. Our speakers this morning are uh, Diana Adorno and Jason Fresnel, uh, both uh, senior and experienced um, uh, user experience analysts. Uh, if they weren't, we probably wouldn't have them up here speaking uh, this morning, so that shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to you. But I do think that the uh, approach uh, that Diana and Jason are outlining to us and that ThoughtWorks is, is trying to bring to the marketplace uh, does take some new, new and interesting approaches that have the promise of producing some pretty mar remarkable results. So without further ado, Diana and Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. So, and as, um, as Keith said, is both Agile and customer experience practices have been around for a long time, and what we're trying to do is bring them together. 
So I wanted to talk to you about how we're going to sort of structure today so that you know what to expect. So brace yourself for some words. So we have a challenge facing us in as product producers, I suppose, as all of us, and service producers, but the challenge is how do we, how do we create great products for our customers? So we want to introduce you to that idea of what customer experience is. And the context is the not just a, a single product, but also the product development life cycle. So what we recognise is you have to think about your products in a holistic way for, within the organisation. Quality is really important, and you may already be very familiar with the idea of build quality, so great software products or great products. And we want to introduce that idea of experience quality. So what does it mean for a high quality experience? What does that look like? Obviously we're going to look at where we've come from, so looking at an old approach. So the idea of big upfront design, so designing everything up front and throwing it over the fence, versus no design at all, but rapid development. The new, the new approach, obviously, from the title, is it's bringing those two things together. How do we bring an agile framework and customer experience together to help produce <coughs> great products for our customers? So we want to also talk to you about, we did a pilot project recently. We want to share with you some of the things we learned out of that and the motivation for that, how that went. And then just give you some practical advice about a few things you could try this afternoon, in theory. So, or tomorrow morning if you're feeling a bit tired for getting up so early. So, and obviously we'll wrap up and give you a chance for some questions. We sort of recognise also that in the audience we've got a mixture. Some people who are familiar, uh, business sponsors perhaps, so maybe your decision to initiate products. People who are familiar with, with Agile or, or not, but have a technical focus. And obviously user experience practitioners. So, and our challenge today is to bring all those, something together for all, all three. So this is our challenge in the marketplace right now, is how do we create great products? And what does a great product mean? We certainly have an opportunity. So as the marketplace has been changing, we have a challenge to create the best products and systems for customers. But not just customers, any person who's using a system. So that would be staff. Staff is also a customer of those products as well. So for people who are using those things, how can we create the best experience possible? It takes us to step up and take the responsibility to do it. We have to make a decision and decide to, to create great products. It's not something that's just going to happen. We have to take that responsibility and change at a personal level, team and organisational level to make that happen. Unless you're already happy with and satisfied that you're creating great products already. So we have to, what we're going to look at particularly is how do we get there, what's our design process, how do we actually add some rigour into the design. There's a lot of rigour already into our build process, how do we add some rigour into the design process. Companies who are already doing this are starting to move ahead and are seeing advantage. So investing in design brings great return as it's starting to, we're starting to see in the marketplace. Apple is an obvious example. So they, they take it seriously. So investing in prototyping, which is a critical part of a good design process, is not a cost, it's an investment. And you see the great returns from that. And, <coughs> and furthermore, they're actually starting to move ahead. So they, and recently, that was the week before last, is they were actually valued as a large, larger by value than, than Microsoft. So you can see the value of that investment. They're really starting to move ahead. I know that it's an obvious example, but the marketplace has changed. People expect something different. So they've actually experienced what a great product is like and now have that expectation. They no longer blame themselves if they can't use something. And when there's competition, people are starting to move around and make decisions in going to an alternative product. When we're thinking about product, we're also thinking about not just a single product, but a relationship with the organisation. So what are the touch points across the entire organisation? It's important to think about it, again, holistically. So if you have a relationship with, with Apple, is it a single product? Or with Qantas, it's not just a single touch point. So we need to understand wherever it is that a customer interacts with the organisation, we need to recognise that. And our design process needs to take that broader view and we need to be designing our products in that context. <coughs> What we found with the design process, one of the strongest things it tells us what not to build, what not to waste our time on. 
So, is, and that's very critical. So that reduces scope, reduces risk. It tells us what's going to fail before we take it to market. We can fail on paper, so or at the prototyping stage, not fail when it's been released to market. So it's not release it to market and hope something sticks, but you no longer will be building products that nobody will use or nobody wants. So the strongest part of that design process is actually what not to build. So Jason's going to take us through customer experience. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So first of all, there was some confusion around the word experience, so I'm just going to talk a little bit to that. Um, people who do what I do have had lots of different titles in the past, um, and I think that that reflects uh, maturing in the way that we think about what we do. So once upon a time, it was graphic design, and the look and feel really mattered, and that's what was going to matter. Uh, we got more mature and discovered that it's the content or the data that mattered, and then we started realising it's not just that, it's the interaction that makes a big difference. So you ended up with people called interaction designers. Now what we realise is that every customer goes on a journey uh, and the quality of that journey when they're doing things like booking a ticket is the experience. So what we're trying to do is design the quality of that experience. So that's why we're using the word experience design. I'm going to use the word uh, user experience a lot because uh, that's generally what we do I think in this room which is you know, create great experiences on a particular system. Customer experience is that level up that Diana talked about. So um, customer experience, what is it? It's about one thing, I think. It's about vision. Um, that vision needs to do a few things. It needs to balance different needs. Um, on the one hand, it's got the user needs, the unmet needs of the user, and they're willing to pay for those needs with either attention or with some money, and that's good for us. On the other side, you have the business's needs, um, and the business expresses those as usually a strategy, often just as a wanted position. Uh, and it's a way of maintaining their profitability. So you've got those two different needs and the vision, the customer experience vision, needs to balance those and synthesise those. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that uh, because it needs to sit on a very clear base of technology. It's not that it needs to use technology, it's that the project needs to use it in a feasible way and the feasibility part is probably the most important part in this equation. So it needs to be feasible in terms of the money that the project has, the time that you've got and technology that you're going to be using. So the point of this sort of balancing act is to come up with something that's simple, tangible, concrete, something that everyone can stand and look at and say, yes, that's what we want to build, that's desirable, that's what's going to work for us. Um, and it needs to be in a medium that everyone understands uh, so that it's not a, a tech, you know, anyone. Uh, so I guess um, what this is all about is, yeah, we've, when people create software, there's a lot of rigour around that process um, and you just got to question what rigour are we applying to the design process. And I guess, I mean, for me, it's the, it's the thing that comes up again and again when I'm working with um, developers. It's uh, some level of frustration around uh, the, the precision which, with which they work uh, and then they look to us as uh, UX or, or sometimes the product uh, and say, I just don't see the rigour that, that you're applying to your process. I can't transparently see the way you're managing this process. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the product development life cycle. So uh, a lot of what we do is in the delivery space, um, but we've sort of tried to take a step back and look at the whole product life cycle. We see it as, as three phases. There's an envisioning phase, which is really trying to understand what that vision is, trying to understand where that balance is. Um, trying to figure out what it is you're going to do. Uh, delivery is really about finding efficient ways to, to actually deliver on that. And Evolve is that um, probably all too familiar, too late approach to usability where you put something out, you test it uh, in user testing and find out it's not working. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about the envisioning stage uh, because that's where uh, I think it's most interesting to apply Agile principles. So I just want to give a little bit of time to uh, ideas of quality and the difference between uh, build and experience quality. So an easy way to think about it is everyone knows that you can build a building without an architect. Um, it's very possible people do it. And everyone knows that you can build software without experience design. Um, but the thing that you're giving up in both those situations is the quality of experience and that's probably the one thing that, that you will be judged on. Um, so yeah, quality is really what people make decisions on when they're going to you know, inhabit a space or when they're going to use a service. So uh, let's sort of break down those two types of, of, of quality. Um, 
what's clear, I think, is that from the user's point of view, it's very difficult to untangle these two types of quality. Um, so, yeah, build quality has a number of facets. So does experience quality. I'm not going to read them. But I think what is very clear is that um, build quality does not directly lead to experience quality. Um, that, yes, build quality is the foundation on which you can create experience quality, but one does not directly lead to, to the other. Um, and I think in, in this sort of uh, list of list of things, the one that really makes a difference is uh, fit for purpose. No matter how good the tool is, if it's not fit for purpose, then it will be a failure. And um, discovering what that purpose is and, and what fit for purpose means is, is vital. So um, get a bit metaphorical. What do you see here? Um, some people may see the robustness of the structure. They may see the construction and composition of materials, um, some built, built surfaces. Uh, but I'd argue that's not what most people see. What most people see here is a space which gives them opportunity to act. It's uh, the connections and boundaries between places that you can go and some idea that you can move from one place to the other and do things. So I think that's, that's what we do. We create spaces in which people can act. Um, and thinking about it in that way uh, can change the way you, that you approach it. So um, let's talk about ways that uh, we've tried to develop experiences in the past. Um, and I guess the easiest way is to look at two extremes, and then we can try and find a, a, a middle, a middle ground. So big upfront design. Uh, big upfront design starts with the business coming with a need or an idea, um, and it may be well, it may be pre-business case, it may be post-business case, um, but what is unusual is that it probably isn't articulated to the point where you can just start building. Um, so they engage a number of different groups, maybe user experience, maybe some architects, maybe some a, a product manager, uh, and those different groups go about trying to break the problem down and um, build documents. And so they, they create this massive set of documents they're very well crafted, uh, and they try and um, describe what the entire solution is going to do. Um, I've worked in that way a lot, uh, and I have to say I'm very proud of the documents that I did. I think um, they are precise, they were possible, they were very possible, um, and uh, I certainly did what they were expected to do. Um, so yeah, I'm still proud of this work. Uh, so eventually, at some point, uh, this massive pile of documents, um, we engage the people who are actually going to start building, so the dev team. Uh, the dev team tries to understand this 3,000-page document um, and somehow comes back with, with, I just don't understand what we're building. I don't understand the priorities. Um, and this is despite the fact that we've so clearly documented it. Um, so we say it's clear. They say it's not. Um, finger pointing starts. The estimates start getting larger and larger. Scope starts creeping, um, and in my experience, the whole thing can lead to disaster. So um, why it's bad? First reason that it's bad is it owes me about four years of my life. Um, but yeah, the main problem that's bad is this isolated, non-collaborative approach um, that the teams don't really get a chance to work together. Um, that people, user experience designers, can actually make this worse um, because they're setting unrealistic expectations because their primary interface is with the business. And um, well, I know in my case, what I want to do is please. And so I give the business what they want, and the business wants everything. And that's what gets defined. Um, so at some point in this process, we forget that we're building products or we're building software. We're not trying to build a set of documents that get us through a series of toll gates. Uh, the people who are actually going to build um, what, we're, what we're defining haven't been involved in the design of it. Um, now, you could say that's bad because it's inefficient, but I think the real reason that it's bad is because it's depressing for those guys. Um, they aren't involved in the process, and they want to be involved in the process, and they've got a lot to add to the process. So yeah, people are not empowered to take ownership uh, and manage this, this process. It's often managed in a sort of uh, command and control kind of way. And in the end, uh, trust is lost. Trust with the business is lost. And without trust, you can't do anything. So uh, my summary of why big upfront design is bad is it's big ideas that may not be feasible, done very slowly. Um, so that's one extreme position. It's not best practice of any methodology. 
It's just an extreme way of working. That's not good. So let's have a look at another extreme way of working, um, blind incremental development. Uh, it starts off in the same way the business comes to you with an idea or a problem. In this, uh, in this case, uh, what we do is we pull together the development team, uh, all the technology team and the business into a room and we run them through a series of structured workshops over a, an intense two or three week period. Um, out of that, we try and break the problem down into stories, idea, uh, features that are discrete and testable and well defined. Um, we make the business prioritise these, these stories so we've got a clear way of attacking the problem. Um, so it's a great, it's a great method for, <coughs> for understanding the scope of what we're going to do. At that point, we sort of kickstart the development machine, the agile development machine, and this is very good at doing one thing, it's good at delivery. Um, so it has a short time boxed uh, period, it's got feedback loops within it every 24 hours and at the end of every cycle, uh, and this machine starts cranking out these deliverables, and it's all looking really good. The deliverables start coming out the other end, and what sometimes happens is the business starts getting nervous because they're seeing what they're going to get for the first time and it's not meeting their expectations. Um, it's not that you're not doing what they've asked you to do, it's that what they've asked you to do isn't meeting their expectations. Um, so, yeah, despite the fact that you're doing everything that they've asked, it's not turning out how they'd like. Uh, because it's agile, they start requesting rework uh, and start requesting you to go back and change a few things. This causes a bit of stress, usually, because the development team is convinced that they've delivered exactly as, as required and that this is just going to slow the project down and it's, it's not in the best interest of, of, of actually producing something. So the project sort of rolls on and towards the end, at worst case, the business gets uh, the idea that perhaps um, this is not going to meet their expectations. This product is not going to meet their expectations. Uh, so they blame you, you blame them, um, back in, in a bad position. So let's, let's talk about why this particular way of approaching it is bad. The key reason why this may not work is that this whole process assumes that the business knows exactly what it wants up front. Um, and it falls down if, if they don't know exactly what they want up front that uh, the business in this case needs to act as a proxy for the end user. They, uh, we assume that they know, understand their motivations and understand their behaviours and understand how they're going to react to the system. Um, because there aren't any user experience designers usually involved in this process, uh, their, their way of pulling real end users in uh, doesn't happen. So you end up a little bit isolated from um, the way that actual people are going to behave. Because, it's, because of the way it's structured um, and broken down, you often end up delivering an IT solution rather than an experience solution. Because an experience strings together a series of, of functions into a journey. Uh, and uh, because this is re reductive, um, it often doesn't focus on that string together. It just focuses on the continuous delivery of the parts. Uh, and because of that, it's prone to uh, uh, general clunkiness, um, and you may or may not have seen the results of that clunkiness. So, um, to sum up why, why it's bad, uh, so you end up with small ideas that are technically feasible, um, but they still may not deliver actual value to the end users. Uh, but the good news is this is done very quickly, and uh, we actually deliver something. So, like I said, two extreme positions, neither of them best practice, uh, and, and two extreme positions that you probably don't want to be involved with. So um, what's the solution? Uh, so we're working hard to try and figure out what that, what that balance is and, and how to approach it and hence this talk and hence uh, the idea that you can apply agility to, to the customer experience. So um, what does that mean? I guess in the end envisioning that, that, that creative design phase, um, you can apply agility to it because in the end agility or Agile is just a, a philosophical belief and a series of um, mechanical kind of rituals or processes. Um, I guess, I'm not going to go into depth about the Agile Manifesto, but, but in the end it's just about a few things, I think. It's about the fact that people need to work together closely if you're going to achieve something great. Um, it's about understanding that if you're de developing something, you need to work in the medium in which you're going to be delivering it. So 
if you're designing a, uh, a web experience, you need to work in that medium. You need to design in that medium to understand whether or not it's going to work. Uh, it's about trust and shared understanding. And a lot of the, the rituals and methods in Agile are about building that trust and shared understanding. Uh, and it's about you know, agility itself. Yes, things are going to change in the build process. That's as true for the envisioning process. Things are going to change. You need to be ready for that change. You need to be agile. So um, envisioning. Uh, let's talk about that for a moment. Envisioning isn't about uh, reducing costs and reducing the price of the overall project. It's about quality and desirability. And I guess that's, that's the key difference um, between a delivery phase and envisioning phase. Um, one easy way to sort of think about how it works mechanically is that envisioning is not graphic design. Um, probably everyone in this room has been a victim of the four-page graphic design spec that, uh, that you get laid in, in front of you and uh, you say, there's the design, it's all worked out, all you need to do is build it now. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely not graphic design. The, the usual case is that you start off with some sketches and you move up the visual fidelity line, uh, meaning that you know, from the sketch you end up with a, a world of graphic design paper comp the way we're thinking about it is that in, in the design process, you need to move up the functional fidelity line. So you need, as the design rolls along, you need to get better and more interactive prototypes so that you're working in the medium and you understand what the interaction is going to be like. So I guess there's, there's another difference in envisioning is that what you're trying to create is something that's lean, spare and correct. It's, it's a prototype that proves that you're approach to the problem is going to work. Um, other industries do it, and I think um, this is a great example. So Pixar, um, before they create a high rendering of the film that they're producing, they create a low fidelity film. This could be mistaken as a picture of two characters. It's not. It's a frame from the prototype film where they do the timing, they do the character, they do the dialogue, and make sure that what they're going to produce before they actually invest in producing it, is going to have, uh, it's going to resonate with the audience and it's going to be desirable. So they build something that's lean, spare and correct and then once they understand that they, they in fact want that, they create something that's full, complete and built efficiently. And that's, that's one of the, the key differences between envisioning and delivery. So um, what makes envisioning different? Um, I'm not going to uh, read all of those, but uh, really it's that uh, we give space to uh, the design development time um, and that, that that space, we manage it using Agile principles. Um, and uh, we use things like card walls to make sure everyone understands what the task is at hand and how, how we're moving through the whole process. So let's try and uh, look at envisioning in a bit more detail like we did the other two extremes. So I guess in envisioning, the business again comes to you with a problem um, or an idea. It says, hey, we've got to figure out how to execute on this. So we use this incredibly complicated matrix um, and we say, okay, uh, is it lots of interaction and is it experiential? Um, does the business case have you know, words like differentiation through experience or simplicity or engagement or communities? If it has those sort of words, then you're probably up in the right-hand corner if you're building web services, you're probably down in the left-hand side. So if you're up in the right-hand corner, we'd say, I think that envisioning is a, is a phase that you need, to, you need to run through. Envisioning, again, starts by uh, building a team and co-locating them and getting them to, to work together. I guess the difference is that this time, there's most likely a, the role of UX is involved. And importantly, you need to get the end users involved in this early phase and continuously throughout the process. Um, so we get all those people together and we run them through this um, structured workshop uh, method. So uh, I think at Thorgs we're pretty good at those inception quick start type activities, um, but usually they get applied to kicking off a build project. We're saying that these are as useful to an um, envisioning project as they are to a build. So getting a team together, understanding what the objectives are, what the elevator pitch of the particular project is, what's the vision, the business vision that's driving it, you know, context, communications plan, I'm not going to read them all out, but um, they are structured workshop, facilitated workshop activities that bring focus and, and bring a group of people together to come up with a shared understanding of how they're going to attack the problem. 
So yes, we get them together, we put them in a room, and out of that, again, we're probably going to break it down into smaller parts so that we can, we can understand the problem a bit better. Uh, so we'll probably create stories, we'll create story cards, and we'll put them up and prioritise those. Because we're not about building paper prototypes, and because we've got this whole of team approach where we have uh, actually devs and technology people or people who are intimate with the medium involved, we can start developing something. So we kickstart the agile development machine, um, and uh, we start cranking out something. But I think in this, in this case, the something is a little bit different. So rather than trying to re uh, produce discrete, fully functioning, fully tested units, what we're trying to do is create a, a wireframe, overall understanding of what this service is going to do, how is it going to actually um, deliver across all the functions. So yeah, an outline of what it is. We take that outline and we test it with the people who are, up, who are going to use it, the end users, and we test it with the business to understand have we got that, that balance right. Um, and yeah, we understand what, what needs improving and we set about to improve it. Someone uh, wiser than me said, it's not an iteration if you do it only once. And envisioning is when I think we can start taking the word iteration really seriously because um, I think we often don't iterate, we increment, and envisioning is the time when we can, because we're not setting out to build a production level quality product, we can take something, we can build it, we can rebuild it, we can make it better with each iteration. So yes, we iterate, we fill out more detail, we may rebuild it, and again, we test it. We test it with users, we test it with the business, we understand how we got that balance right. It may be easy uh, to get the impression that what I'm saying is we need to create a creative prototype so that we understand just what the user is going to do. But the point is because we've got this whole of team approach, what we're understanding all the way through is how feasible is this particular solution? How feasible is it to build this prototype? Um, so yeah, we're trying to maintain that balance. Again, we iterate, we test, and we improve. Um, so out of that, we come up with something that is a prototype that's lean, spare and correct, that says everyone can point it and say, yes, that's what we want to build, that's it. So um, other industries, uh, prototype, I don't understand why we don't, why we don't invest more time and, and, and thought into this. Prototyping is the best way of proving a principle or proving that you understand the problem and you have a feasible solution. Um, it's the best way to communicate your idea. Uh, it, it doesn't require an abstracted uh, sort of description. It is in itself expressing what it does. Um, it's the only way to really get user involvement. Um, without a prototype, it's very difficult to understand whether or not it is going to be viable or whether it is fit for the purpose that, that you're trying to create. Uh, it's concrete, tangible, it's in the medium. And it, this is a bit silly, but look, you can't prototype a car and paper. And I think what we do is very experiential. It involves movement, involves movement through places. Uh, so yeah, the innovation mantra, um, fail fast, fail early, fail cheaply. Envisioning gives us the space to do that uh, because the last thing you want is slow, late, and massive failure. Uh, and um, so this is a phase that helps us avoid that. So apologies. Um, I think that the same sort of uh, user experience and, and uh, agile meeting can happen during the delivery and evolve phase, um, but I'm not going to talk a, a lot to those. Uh, we've been thinking about how you get UX to work within the agile delivery phase, um, and I think in some ways it's similar to the role of a BA, except that the BA is usually about breaking things down and uh, about facing the business, whereas UX is about synthesizing things into a whole and about facing uh, the users, the end users. So. Um, Often, in my experience, the tricky thing is finding a balance working with the BAs, but that's something that, um, that uh, the UX is in this room or be on a journey, you can work it out for yourself. Uh, so I guess the call to action is um, become part of the design process. Every, everyone in this room um, has something to add to the design process. Um, and in particular, that prototyping phase, UXs will attempt to prototype the experience um, with or without your help. Um, at the moment, I'm doing it with things like Balsamic or other rapid prototyping tools or hacking it together in HTML or with image maps or any way that I can to simulate 
how, how the actual application is going to work. Um, I've heard developers say to me many times, dude, I could do that almost as fast in, in real code. Um, so this is a chance, the envisioning phase gives us a chance to, get to work together in that way and for the dev to prove that they can actually do it as quickly and to prototype, to become part of that process. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we can do it so much better together. Um, and doing it better is going to mean transforming. Uh, transforming means different things for, for different people. Um, I'm going to speak directly to the UXs in the room that um, you need to move away from the idea that the spec that you're producing is the design. The spec is not the design. What gets built is the design. Um, and once you make that sort of that, that change, uh, it fundamentally changes the way you're working because suddenly you're working on influencing and improving the quality of what's being built. You're not working on creating a portfolio piece um, that is uh, separate from the build. You can't, you, you, once, you, once, you, once you enter that, that way of working, you can't ever say the design was great, but they failed to deliver on it. In fact, you failed to deliver on it. Um, so yeah, for, for IT and for other people, it means, it means different things. But um, yeah, I think for all of us, it means expanding our, our measure of, of success beyond uh, build quality to, towards experience quality. So um, that's a lot of talk about how we think we should approach it. Um, how we have approached it uh, recently was in a, in a pilot envisioning project at Real Estate. Um, Daniel talked uh, briefly to this in Melbourne. Um, so I'm going to try and parrot what he said. Uh, basically, uh, the context was that REA uh, had recently gone through a huge transformation, both in terms of uh, technology that they were using and in their approach, and part of that was uh, in transforming towards Agile. Um, the one thing that uh, really resonated with me was that he said that as soon as the delivery team um, got better at pushing things out the door, got better at delivery, their aspirations actually changed. Um, they no longer uh, were just interested in uh, delivery because they were getting very good at that. They wanted to get more involved in the commercial and, and creative product definition phase because they felt like they had a lot to add to it. Um, so uh, that played into the hands of, of, our, of our pitch, which was, OK, we're going to bring together um, all of the people in your organisation and uh, run them through the envision phase. So the approach, we ran an inception. Uh, we aligned those people. We went in and did this sort of prototyping phase uh, with them. Uh, we researched and tested throughout uh, and uh, we reviewed. So I guess um, the results of that were that uh, they thought that having different people in the room actually resulted in a better quality of design uh, and a more balanced uh, uh, approach. Um, and the IT and operations teams started thinking more about what this meant for the future uh, and, and what sort of things they'd need to spike quite early in the process. Um, it killed bad ideas very early, uh, and that was probably the most, the best thing, because there were a lot of ideas that were floating around, uh, and we need to focus on which ones we were really going to uh, pursue. Uh, and everyone engaged with the design and had their input. So um, I'm going to hand over now to Diana. She's going to talk about um, some practical advice or steps that you can take away with you. Um, and then I'll be back to wrap it up. So thanks. Thanks, Jason. So with the practical advice, this is activities that you can do if you're doing envisioning, so if you're actually building a prototype, or if you're actually in delivery. So some of these things is what we learnt as we went through the, the pilot with realestate.com. So some of them, I can tell some of the stories around what we tried there, as well as things that we think are good ideas. So these is obviously not everything you can do, but where to start. So the first thing is to actually get some experienced design into your team and make them just part of the team. So it's, um, yeah, so we actually do need to have an experienced designer or a user experienced designer come into the team and work with the team to actually help facilitate the design. It's not that they then own the design, but they just join in with all the activities and are just a natural part of the team. But it's also important that that person coaches the rest of the team, that they share what they do. And that's a real challenge because in some ways, user experienced designers and developers say, can be speaking different languages. So there's a real challenge there is how do you then collaborate? But basically everyone joins in to all of the activities, especially around joint design, and everyone participates in as many of the activities as possible, and you work out 
and you get better and better at, at the communication. The other thing that we found was really powerful was bringing users in all the way through, right from week one. So obviously in, in the beginning you go, well, what are we going to do with users when there's no, nothing to show? Is user research is still really important. And in the beginning you're doing some research activity, so you might be actually mapping out a customer journey, or you might be doing some, a card sorting activity to try and tease out, understand the people that you're designing for. And it's important that you actually do understand the people you're designing for really, really well. And it's better to go deep than wide. Quite often we have techniques where you survey 100 people, but that doesn't give you any real design information. It might give you marketing information, but design information is different. So getting to know a few people is much better than getting to know 100 people. So it's better to actually get deeper and deeper. And you can see in there, we're just working in the room that we're working in, so there's no need to be precious and have a separate room. We started off in a more traditional way. We had two days booked and we had a video and it was a separate room. And a, a big challenge was actually booking a room for, for two days. It was really difficult to do. So we actually decided after the first day that we actually had enough information to then iterate the design. So we cancelled the second day and moved it to the second week. And what we found is having users come in continuously, but in that really light way, is that it really crystallised. We had to have something to show them. So in the beginning, you might be showing them competitor products, or you might be showing hand-drawn sketches, or you might do activities where you get them to do the work. So this was an example of one where we got them to build their own screen. So not that we, you know, so go, OK, you do the work <laughs> instead of us, is we talked to them first and kind of got a, a bit of an understanding about what was important to them. And then we also went and had a look at competitors and we came up with some ideas ourselves and actually just had the components cut out and then they built their own screen. And it wasn't that we we're going to use the design of the screen themselves, is what they said as they went through the activity was really powerful. And we found that across the board, everyone said this, the, top, the priority, top priority things, everything at the top of the screen was identical across everybody and then it changed a little as they went down. And so we started to form a bit of a picture about the personas that people fall into. So a persona is something that is, uh, that we build. So it's uh, the idea of who we're, we're building for. And we found as we spoke to, to the users that it fell into, say, two main personas. And that was kind of the two main behavioural things that they were doing. It's important when you build the personas, one, that you build them, and secondly, that they are based on real research. So as you, you may start off in the beginning with just having a sketch drawing of, you're not quite sure, but as you do your research week by week, is you're building that out and getting a better and better understanding of their motivations, their behaviours, what they like, what they don't like. And it really helps to crystallise the whole team of who you're building for. So you're not, you're not trying to build for everyone and every possible behaviour, but actually crystallising exactly who is it that you're building for. And what is it that they're capable of doing and what, what do they like doing? It's, and it really just, again, helps really clarify what we're doing when we do the design work. The other thing is actually have a good understanding of where it's going to be used. So people have told me stories about they're building a system for dog catchers and so they actually spent a day going around in the car with them. I think they actually said that they then apologised having watched them use the IT the system that they had to use. Um, but it was, it was really important to understand where it's going to be used. Now a lot of our systems may be used in offices, but again it's important to go to those offices and see is it very quiet so, or is it really noisy? Because those things can influence how you, how you actually, you know, if there's some kind of if you alert of some kind, sound may be completely inappropriate, those kinds of things. So you have to have an understanding. And it's also to understand how they're already doing the work that they're doing. Quite often they'll have a very elaborate manual process that works incredibly well that they've built over time. So we also saw when we did some research for a financial product is they were using a very complex product and, which was web-based but they had bookmarked five pages. There were actually hundreds of features in this uh, product but they would bookmarked five and they would just go straight to those points because it was actually quite difficult to use. So it's good to then find that out. Or they might have built their own Excel spreadsheet which pulled in information from other places and having a look at what they've built for themselves as well as what's on their whiteboard and also shortcuts that are actually above, um, above their workspace. And quite often, of course, you'll see passwords stuck to the, stuck to the screens. <laughs> so it's, but those things are really useful to gather and it only takes one visit to really crystallise 
what you can't do in those environments, but also if you see it the way they do, their manual process can actually give you a really good picture of what you're actually trying to build. So, and it's quite a challenge to do a better job than those manual systems. The challenge with the research and the activities with the users is distilling those findings as quickly as possible because putting them together and putting them into a report is not going to work because you can't share it. So taking notes on post-it notes, one idea per note, is a really good way to do it. So, but even then you can end up with a sea of post-it notes, so it's, you have to have a be, be fairly disciplined. And the discipline is actually to distill it as soon as you finish the session, or as close to when you finished it as possible. If you're seeing eight people and you have no time between each session, you lose a lot. So if you have, say, two or three sessions a day, and you allow yourself to have a session and come together, and you'd actually have, say, maybe a developer or a, a BA or someone else taking the notes, then they hear it firsthand. And also if you're working in the environment, like just in the workspace where everyone is there, eavesdropping is a really nice way to overhear what's going on. So nothing better than hearing it firsthand. If you can video it, and we just, in the end, just use the camera off the laptop if we were showing a screen, that works, that works fairly well. But take a note of the time if they say something significant so you can go back to it so you don't have to, to listen to the whole thing again. But as much as possible, experiment with what's, what's going to work and do you need to have any of that information later. So in here you can see that what we've done is We've talked about it and then immediately started to cluster it around features or around things that we thought, thought were important. So we do that jointly. So in that way you can actually have multiple sessions going on at once. Then everyone comes together to listen what they heard in the session and then actually start to uh, distill it into what are the design challenges, what are the design implications and do that very fast. Another way we, could, we did it was actually drawing directly onto the design themselves. So you can either do that in session with the users, or you could actually do that immediately afterwards. So as soon as you've heard something, you might know straight away where there's a challenge on the design itself. Again, just experiment with different ways of doing it. But that, that, worked. that worked well. So it's not that you use one or the other. Sometimes you're doing all of those things. So you might have post-it notes, and you'll have the screens. So your note taker might be marking on the screen itself. If there's a lot of screens, that gets a bit out of hand. Um, but if you're showing the screens to, to users and it's on paper and it doesn't look too neat, if it's already got notes on it already, that'll encourage them more to, to add, on, add to it. So setting up a design wall is really important. So visualise the design. So where are you up to? So this is whether you're doing building a prototype or, or delivering uh, your, your full product. Is Seeing where you're at is really important and so everyone else can comment on it. So once you've set up this space, it's actually an informal space. People walk past it and actually can add notes to it um, and talk about it so that it's not just buried on someone's screen. It's very hard to share. So actually coming up on, on putting a design wall up and keeping it changing is really important. So keeping it fresh so that it keeps coming back. As well as having a space on that same wall for ideas and challenges, I don't want to call them issues, but is, so we get lots of ideas. So in the, um, in the pilot, so Daniel, as the CIO had some, had some ideas that he wanted tested. Well, he had some ideas, so we, so we included those. The fact that we killed them off after week one, <laughs> actually coped pretty well, really. <laughs> we kept them in for week two and said, you know, we've got to make sure that uh, it wasn't the way that we tested it. So, you know, you leave it in there for a couple of rounds. And, uh, yeah, so it's important to still keep the rigour in your processes. But it's, but you know, killing off ideas, not that that's our mission, but what you want to do is what's going to work and what's not. And we found actually, you know, some ideas absolutely terrified people. So you go, okay, or you, they're actually polarised. So how do we then deal with that? So, and how we dealt with it was actually forcing people, not for, uh, ask people to log in to get access to something that maybe some people thought was sensitive. So actually, in some cases, not ma making it less easy to use, putting barriers in, makes people feel secure. That's certainly true for financial systems. Actually, barriers are good things because people feel that it's more secure. And that was not, not something that you would necessarily assume. Joint design sessions work really well. Again, another opportunity for anyone who's ar around, basically, to help join in with the design session. Or you might actually run a formal session saying everyone needs to be part, part of this. But what we found with the envisioning process, you're actually moving very fast. And so you're doing some research session and then you do, soon after you do a, a joint design session. So it's important that the design is chunked into large pieces. 
so that you are solving a large problem. And so we did a quick uh, brainstorm whiteboard session, then we all um, drew on paper, stuck that over the top of the, the whiteboard, and then after that uh, paired up and actually then tried to build the, the prototype itself. So there was a pairing between the, the user experience designers and, and devs or with the, a visual designer. It's just a mixture. The point is pairing is very, very powerful. It moves it fast um, and it's a very productive way to work and it doesn't really matter who's, who's doing the pairing. And again, it's a good way to exchange ideas and for people to immerse themselves in the design problem. Building interactive prototypes is really important. And as Jason was saying, is the challenge for us is building prototypes is something that, that is really important to do. The more interactive, the better. Early on in the process, when you've got, it's okay to use paper, when you're doing research and you're getting people to build their own screens, those kind of activities. But when you've actually got, you're fairly mature, and mature might be two or three weeks in, it's, you get mature very fast, is uh, you actually need something interactive because you want to test it. So initially you might be testing um, competitor products, but the more interactive we make it, the better and the easier it is to test. And actually, then you can go into more traditional user testing where you give them a task and watch them navigate through it. When they've got to say only some areas work and some don't, it actually really interrupts it. You can't say, you have to say, you have to click here. It's not the same thing <laughs> as, as watching people actually do it. So the more interactive, the better. The other thing to do is to start track actual usage. So these are stats that would then be fed into the, pro into the, into the whatever project that you're doing. You start to, this would be organisation wide anyway, so if you've got uh, products that are already out on the market, you start to track the actual usage and bring that, that data in. And obviously you need to actually have a good interpretation. Tracking is one part of it, but actually then interpreting that, that data is the next part. And then you can do things like multivariant testing. Multivariant testing is when you're actually releasing um, something to a small pool and then you actually, you're not quite sure which, which version is going to work or you've got a high risk system, you're not quite sure which component should work. In terms of placement um, is you release 25% you know, to, to four different groups and track actual usage. So th those users will only see that same version but you can track the actual usage to see, to see which one is successful and that works well coupled with tracking doing actual tracking as well. So those were some of the things that, that we tried and that we know no work at, at any level. So whether you're doing building a prototype or doing delivery of a product. And those are sort of fairly practical things that fit in with some of them we've, we've borrowed from, from the Agile framework, but they, they all work really well. And we found they really crystallised what we were doing in the project because it's easy to get lost in some of these projects. So I'll just hand it to Jason to, to wrap up. So I guess the key messages are that um, there's a real opportunity for us to do this better um, and uh, that we can apply the rigour that we apply to uh, d design and to, sorry, development management to the design process um, and that uh, I think it's, it's an exciting way of working. I'm, I'm excited about uh, working in that way. Um, there are a lot of people who are thinking about how to do this. Um, the guys on the left are more towards the agile sort of community side, the guys on the right are sort of in the product and innovation side. Uh, they're all worth a look. Um, in particular, Anders and Mark, um, who you can sort of get to their blogs through our website, are prolific in, in talking about uh, this integration um, and are worth a look. And Jeff Patton's probably been thinking about this longer than anyone. Uh, he's an ex-thought worker. So yeah, uh, if you're interested, there is, a, is material out there. Um, let's just uh, cover off some of the key things. So experience. Um, What's clear is that every time we build software, we create an experience. Experience comes for free, but I would suggest that's not what you want to pay for it um, because you're going to give up on the quality of that experience and that's what you'll be judged by. Um, so experience is the product. Um, so let's start designing the product, uh, not the technology. Uh, stay agile, agility can be applied to envisioning um, the, the need for coordination, for speed, and the ability to respond are as important to uh, the product design phase as they are to the uh, product delivery phase. Um, but there are three different sort of layers of success. Uh, the first is that you tried really hard and you failed. Uh, that at least you learned something in that sort of uh, way. The second is that you delivered to the expectations of the business 
uh, but it failed in the marketplace and that's probably the most uh, frustrating sort of success. Uh, the third is that you delivered to the expectations of your customers and it was a wild success and that's all what we all want to be doing. It's what makes uh, working enriching um, and hopefully this is a, a process that will give space for that to happen. Uh, Agile in the end is about, I think, empowerment. Empowerment of people who are really smart, who can move beyond the, the, their usual boundaries. I think this way of working uh, lets those people do that. Um, uh, yeah, once you get really good at delivery, your aspirations are going to change and you're going to be more, more involved in that commercial and creative side. Um, so yeah, you have the power to sort of insist on that. I'm going to wrap up by saying we covered a lot. Uh, we covered the challenge and an introduction to experience design. We've talked about two very extreme ways of approaching it and we've talked about maybe a way of bringing those two things together in the middle. We talked about quality and uh, the pilot that we did. Um, and. Uh, we've got some uh, next steps. So um, thank you very much for coming. The last thing is that uh, I think this is a real chance for us to take the initiative. I guess UX are the bridge, I think, between technology and the business. And I think that the technology group are the ones who are best positioned to build that bridge. Um, that in the past I've always been um, engaged by the business. Uh, I think once IT start uh, saying this is the kind of quality that we want to show, these are the kind of processes that we want to have when we're building stuff, um, that's, that's when uh, we can start doing it really well. So, um, yeah, execution is our game, strategy is our victim. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so we'll just finish up with some questions. Bringing on um, agile processes and I suppose we're told that you need to think about user stories and they should all be independent and you build them, you know, they should be sort of around two weeks build size. You prioritize the order and you build them out. And I suppose the challenge for us is the fact that looking at your diagram of the Mona Lisa, you suggested I suppose that the, all the stories are the sum of the whole experience and you actually start with the outline and you build up. So it suggested you did an outline of all the stories and build up. I just wondered if, is that your experience or is there some way in between? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's the whole point of that envisioning part is that it gives you the space to build that outline because if you, if you run blindly into agile development, you uh, hit exactly what you're talking about, which is very discrete, small features um, that are delivered incrementally. So I, it, it, I guess the proposition is that it, 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 it allows us to build that wireframe first, that wireframe view of what the total product is going to be like. Um, and then... If need be, you can go into the delivery phase and you can increment. Um, and it's not a problem because you know how all, all of those small parts are meant to fit together, but without having thought about how they all string together, without having thought about how you create real customer journeys, um, you, you may end up with uh, a very siloed, <coughs> nav-based nav um, uh, design, which uh, forces the users to figure out how the hell they're meant to do things, um, mm. instead of you just taking them on that journey. So. Yeah, because I can add to that is having that large picture of the design also allows you to test it first so that you know the stories that come out of it are real stories based on data and you know that that's actually a product that someone will want to use. So actually having something testable that you can verify and start bringing real data in as early as possible is really important. So you're not generating and looking at stories and, and it's estimating things that you know that you're unsure of whether they're going to work or not. So that's where we, we find actually it can potentially narrow scope and you may have fewer stories to build perhaps. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Way in the back. Hi. Um, when you talk about envisioning, do you also do you mean that that's done in the inception process, or uh, is it a separate phase prior to that, or how do you see it sort of fitting in? Okay. The way the way that it's, it's working at the moment, uh, the way that, that we've been uh, working on it is it is a separate phase to the build. Uh, inception, um, and uh, but I actually think that envisioning or having more uh, user experience design can augment the the base the standard build inception. So it can be there can be extra activities that will help you know get that balance between user and business needs um, uh, a little clearer uh, in the build inception. But uh, the work that we're doing at the moment is largely around. I mean, the, the to answer your question. It seems like the biggest gap in the whole product life cycle is um, quality and clarity around um, strategic, how to, how to execute on strategic vision. Um, 
usually at the, at the build phase, we're quite good at going, oh, we've got a known problem, we know how to break that known problem down, let's go ahead. Um, but uh, I guess the, the reason that we, we, we're doing it at separate phases is because it's where, it's where the largest need, I think, is, is at the moment. Um, so, yeah, long answer to a short question. Yes, it is a separate phase. Um, sorry, we're selling. Is the envisioning phase also where you distill what the features are going to be or just get a very broad view? Yeah, I mean, it's, have to, and it's, that's part of the requirements gathering process. Yeah, it's it's a chance to say rather than saying we've got seven hundred features, it's a, it's a chance to say so forty seven of these features actually all string together in this one, you know, procurement process, um, and uh, let's focus on making that process as good as we can rather than focusing on all the edge cases around each of those functions. Um, so yeah, it gives it, it gives it that time to go right. This is clearly what we're trying to do. I think to, to add to that with the, the, the case study that we did was actually an envisioning project that was very strategic, so therefore conceptual and very broad. What was going to happen from then is that it would go into the PMO and it would be broken down into individual projects, which would be a part of that envision because it was very broad. And as it goes into the projects, there would be an inception for the project and, and part of that inception would be to re-immerse themselves in that design problem take the part of the, that envisioning into it and possibly do some additional activities on it to get down to the detail that you need. So the answer is both, but it's so much more powerful if there is a separate envisioning, broad conceptual envisioning first that feeds into the projects themselves. I mean, the reality is now, is if that doesn't exist, then adding some envisioning and trying to prototype early as part of inception adds a lot of value in, into what you're doing straight away. But there's, in terms of overall organisational direction, actually having strong envisioning as a separate phase has a, has a lot of benefit and, and improves the feed into the, into the delivery projects. Yeah, so it's, it's very easy to mine, mine a prototype for new initiatives. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, just, I think if you think about, we're sort of expanding the, the conceptual area of, of applying agility. I mean, if you looked at the literature five or six years ago, around Agile, it was all about um, software development processes. You know, once you were, once you pulled the pre trigger and you were in the project, it was how to do that build quality better. F about five years ago, I thought we were spent a lot of time thinking about, well, how do we take everything we've learned from the, the Agile build problem and, and, sol and solving that? How do we move that into requirements management? Because if you don't understand mm -hmm. how to do that on your, how to do that iterative incremental thing on your requirements, you're going to, you know, how are you going to know what to build? And, and hence things like quick start and inception processes. And now I think we're sort of moving it further, further to the left, further up the value chain by saying, well, how do we take all those things we learned about iterative and agile development and apply them to the ideation? You know, what, what, what are we thinking about here? What's the mm. product or service that we want to build? And how do we iterate through that, those ideas quickly and maybe prototype them with stakeholders and customers and so we get greater fidelity and greater clarity on that early rather than doing a lot of work very expensive and then having it crash. I think that's kind of the idea. I asked, actually, I asked a question in Brisbane, which I forgot to ask here, so let me, let me throw one to you guys. Um, how many people in the room are doing, uh, work for organizations that are doing, or let's say you individually are working on, on projects and using some kind of agile methods? Just a show of hands, how many people? A lot more than Brisbane, so most people in the room. And how many people have user experience practices in your organization? That's interesting. A lot fewer. Still, still more than Brisbane, which I guess is a country town. Um, in, in the big smoke, a lot of people are doing that. And how many people have, have figured out how to put those together? <laughs> Two. So, you know, we're on a journey here, and, and we don't claim to have all the answers either, but we think it's worth asking these questions, and we just want to share with you the, the ways that, we, that we're going about doing this. So, you know, go back home and work on it yourself as well. <laughs> or call us. <laughs> Is that... Any other questions? Andrew, did you have your hand up? I couldn't... Oh, you're just swatting up the line. Okay. Here's one. How big a customer size, sample size, do you need when you're doing user testing? Okay. Um, so... <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll try and then you can okay, go for it. Okay, <laughs> and I'll start with it. It's the, what you have to do is, is you still in, in, in have rigour in terms of thinking about what are the groups that you're trying to get across. So, but the sample size is not as important as actually the depth that you get. So, and quite often you actually can cover quite a lot of users throughout the project because you're bringing them in so frequently. 
So in fact, you do end up with some good coverage. And what we also found is we had some people come in multiple times. So not everyone. So you're doing both. You're actually getting fresh looks and you're actually building a relationship with some people and they get, you get to know them better and better and they also start to get pretty excited about contributing to the design. So you'll actually start to get some ideas and they'll start to bring you stories <coughs> from their environment into it as well. So. Yeah, I mean, look, that whole agility thing, it's like reducing the cycle time, reducing the feedback loop um, and getting leaner. And that so, it works so well with um, bringing users in. Like, get them coming in regularly. Don't turn it into a big deal. Mm. And, um, and yeah, reduce that sort of the, the, the feedback cycle time. Uh, we had them coming once a week and there was only a few of them. Um, but it really kept us honest and it really got us into that kind of, um, how do they call it, like, not canter, but this, this regular yeah. pace at which we were pushing out the prototypes and making sure we actually had something to, to show kept us really honest mm. because I mean in the past like you know you go to the business and say oh so we want to do some research we want to do some user testing it's going to take like you know, three to six weeks it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars uh, and we'll give you a big report and often those reports um, it's not very clear how to extract true design insight out of them they may give you behavioral insight but how to exactly apply that to the product that you're trying to develop isn't so clear. And so by reducing those cycle times down and actually always focusing on the medium, on the product that you're building, um, it, it, it gets rid of all that sort of noise around, oh, so there's behaviours, but we don't know how to apply them. Yeah. Um, so, I think yeah. It's, yeah, it also kept, because it can get messy, the design process is pretty messy sometimes, and it, having people come in forces you to go, well, you need to show something. So it actually forces you to lift up and, and bring the whole thing together as well. And that was, that was really valuable about keeping that, that project on track as well and keeping it really clear. So I there mean, was I, lots of benefit. I had a dream one day uh, that <laughs> um, when people kick up, must you know, start a project and they're doing funding, yeah. they'll actually allocate funding to um, an end user. Uh, and it's not one person, it's just money that uh, you hand over to a recruitment agency and for the next six months you get three people a week. Mm. No questions asked. Uh, mm. You can sort of, yeah, you can refine the, um, the profile of, of the people who you're recruiting throughout that process, but the fact is they're going to come every week and you better be ready and you better be ready to, to, to actually fold their feedback back into what you're doing. Um, I reckon that kind of honesty and regularity would, would make a huge difference. So, you know, usually CCD is all about, you know, get, get users involved, we're saying, or get users involved all the time. Mm. So. Should you have a cross-section of users from your tech savvies to your, um, you know, to the users who don't know what they're doing? Uh, that, that's part of the picture. It depends on what you're building. So is that, that would be part of the profile. And if it's important for you or whatever you're building, is that people either are immersed in technology or not. That's, that's going to be part of their profile. Generally, it's good to get a range. But the one that we did um, recently is we specifically want people who are comfortable with technology and were early adopters because of, because of the ideas that we were showing. So it really it depends. But generally, it's good to get, um, I think, early on. And it's always good to have your developers see a range of abilities with technology. So. So I mean, I don't think it changes the whole CCD approach to what, how to recruit and you know what mm. user profiles are and stuff like that. Um, it just changes how often you get those people in. So there's a lot of mature thinking around how do you engage real people. So. Other questions? What's the uh So I think uh, an interactive prototype is one. Um, usually I've found in the past just having that prototype, even if it's got a script, um, is dangerous. So you probably need to catch a, capture screenshots of key templates or pages within that and do a few notes around it. So I'm not saying produce a big document, but produce something that supports that, that prototype. Um, the other thing, and you get lots of byproducts from that, so it could be a really brief overview of what we discovered when we engage lots of customers, what, what their key motivations are, and out of that you get those personas. Um, and the other thing is that you probably get a pretty good um, kickstart of uh, what the kind of agile stories are going to be, because you've already gone through a bit of a process of trying to develop stories that um, make sense. So uh, it's not heavyweight deliverables, but it is. Um, it should be a tested, well-articulated vision of what we consider mm. is desirable and what we want to build. Yeah. So it still it doesn't negate the need to have a build inception and to get shared understanding of the development team around what they're trying to build. Um, it, it may just simply be input into the build inception. Um, but 
really, I think the main deliverable is, is a level of kind of excitement and enthusiasm that, yeah, yeah, this is cool, we should do this. I, th I think there's also that shared, shared understanding of what, it, what, what you're building and why. What we found with people who, so the, we had um, developers and operations people sort of across it as well as the business stakeholders and other designers in the organisation. But it was important, what we heard was they were really pleased to get, they said early warning so they know what's kind of coming down the line so they can think about it. As well as people sort of saying there's things that we know we don't need to do or that we shouldn't do. So those technical takeaways were also captured as well. As well as the real data from, you know, we captured um, as posters of what the what we found with user testing and as well as and the posters that go onto the wall so uh, that would be going to build project actually shows the screen so the screenshots are the, the design concept and the design thinking and the design learning and again what was missed also was important and those things would then go as posters as an output and then go as an input into the build into the build process so there was a few things there Yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, I was I was reading the I hate to bring Apple up, but the the uh, human interface guidelines, and you know, one of the first few pages is they say, oh, so here's a typical project. You probably spend about five percent of your time on design and the rest on on build. Uh, if you're developing iPhone apps, what we suggest you do is spend like a massive amount. I think it was like forty or fifty percent of the time. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, Apple. We understand, I can't just say, we understand that they spend about 15% of the entire project budget on a prototyping phase. So it's probably a good guideline, but I mean, you know, it depends. Um, but probably more than what you're doing now is the answer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's really, I mean, it's, it's that thing about, um, it's, it's, that's why I sort of feel like I'm going on and on about it, but that quality, that different ideas of quality. Like, imagine we applied the same amount of rigour and, and budget to uh, user testing as we did to functional testing. So probably got whole teams and continuous integration and these really great processes for ensuring functional quality. Um, and what percentage of that are we spending on actually understanding is our product going to survive in the real world? Uh, is it going to be fit for purpose? Because um, the real world is really messy. It's always scary. Like, you know, you, you end up going from this big fish in a small pond, that's your organisation and your project, uh, and then you get thrown into the middle of the ocean. And um, yeah. yeah, getting a bit of early warning on how big that ocean is is kind of a good thing. Mm. So. Any other questions or comments? All right, thanks very much for coming this morning, and join me in thanking Jason and Diane.